exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. I just want to thank Pastor Taylor for giving me this opportunity. What a, it's a, a wonderful thing. It's kind of like you ever run into someone you're, you're maybe, I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, you ever run into someone just random, like in a restaurant or somewhere, you, you see the couple next to you praying for their meal, and you get, get talking, you find out you're, you're both believers, and, and it's just like the most wonderful, it's like a little preview of, of what we'll experience in heaven, right? Well, whenever I get to go to a different church, it's just, it's wonderful to be amongst uh, another church family and, and just meet other believers. It's, a, it's just a wonderful opportunity, so I want to thank Pastor Taylor for giving me this opportunity. I, I get to do this. For, I mean, not, not so often anymore. I, I used to do it a lot more. I get to. I've gone all over New York State and preached at different churches, and um, it, it's always just it's it's wonderful. So thank you all for being here this morning for having me. Um, it, this is an incredibly beautiful church, by the way. I, I pulled up. I was like, oh my goodness. So I. I pulled a, a cross over there and took a little picture like I get to you know I get to preach in this little church this is a beautiful church um so yeah like he said my name is Isaiah I am an elder at the Baptist Church of Northville uh I was also their youth director for uh, a number of years and I still help out with youth I've been I've been doing youth ministry essentially since I was a youth essentially since I was in 11th grade um I've also, pre like I said, I preach at different churches, I preach at different youth conferences, things like that, uh, and um, and now I am here and I'm an elder at the Baptist Church of Northville. So yeah, when I was uh, first communicating with Pastor Taylor, he told me, don't, you know, I'm preaching out of the book of John, so, which is funny too, because Pastor Larson, I don't know if he told you this, but he's also, my, our pastor is preaching out of the book of John as well, uh, and just started it last week actually, and uh so I was like, okay, so I won't do, one of my go-tos when I go to a new church is I preach out of one of the accounts, but it, it's not out of John, but it's in John, so I was like, okay, I, I won't do that one, and I was actually pretty excited because I had just, well, I hadn't even finished it yet, I, I'm still, haven't quite, I've mostly finished this one sermon on Isaiah chapter 6, and I was all excited, I was like, oh, I get to do this, I even told Pastor Larson, because he knew I was working on it. Uh, and he's like, oh, cool, yeah, finally you get to do that. Because he had actually spoiled it for me. I had just finished my outline and started doing the first two points, and then he preached out of Isaiah chapter 6 at my church, and I was scheduled to preach there in two weeks, and I was like, oh, now I can't do that, so I kind of put it on by the wayside. So I started working on it again when I thought that that's what I was going to preach that day, and then he told me he had just preached out of Isaiah chapter 6. I was like, okay, all right. So I will do my, uh, uh, one of my sermons out of my Romans chapter 12 series that I did. I haven't actually finished Romans chapter 12, but this is, I've, I've gone through most of Romans chapter 12. And this is one of my favorites. And it's one of my favorites because when I first prepared it, actually, every time I look at it, I just feel like a, a, just a steaming pile of garbage, right? Every time I look at these verses and look at how we are to love without hypocrisy, I look at my own life and my own shortcomings and I am just, oh, I, I feel terrible. So misery loves company. So I like to share that when I go to different places so you too can feel terrible about yourselves. That's, that's kind of my goal here. Um, no. So I will, uh, I'll read... Uh, Romans chapter 12 up basically up to our verses that we're going to go through today just for context I'll pray and then we'll dive right in I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and many members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, 
in the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we could be here this morning. Please just let our hearts be right as, as we look into your word and as we continue to worship you this morning, Lord. And please help me as I teach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, everything in Romans chapter 12 builds to these verses, essentially. We start out with, um, in view of God's mercy, right? Uh, this is really where we should start out each and every each and every day. We should be waking up in view of God's mercy, in view of what Jesus did for us on the cross, is how we should start our day every single day. Um, and then he goes into how we are to not be like the world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We are to continually be transformed. We're supposed to even transform the way in which we think through God's word. This whole thing is Paul telling us how, how we are basically, to, how, how we are to love God, right? And then he goes into how we are to treat each other in Romans chapter 12. Um, and he reminds us to be humble, to exercise our spiritual gifts that we've been given. And interestingly enough, Paul does the same thing here in Romans. He, he does the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. In chapter 12 where he goes through most of it basically explaining t about spiritual gifts and how they are a church body with different members. And then he goes into love in chapter 13 where he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy, noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Paul then goes deeper in our text, though, um, and this is as, as Stephen Lawson put it, who, if you don't know who, who Stephen Lawson is, he's a, a wonderful teacher. You can find him on YouTube, uh, find him all over the place. He, he has some books and some other things of that. And he's a wonderful, wonderful teacher, does a, a, a Bible study um, pretty much every, I think every week online that I love. And uh, he called this, this section that we're about to go through, personal holiness spelled out. And it really is. It is personal holiness spelled out. So we start out with, let love be genuine. Or, or the, the Greek, um, the original Greek literally just says, love without hypocrisy. And many commentators and theologians that um, I went through when I was preparing this basically said that this is, this little section, let love be genuine, is basically the heading for what's to follow. It is essentially what basically saying that what is to follow is how we are to love without hypocrisy. And the type of love that's used here is agape love. This is um, self-sacrificial love, right? The kind of love where we aren't concerned about ourselves at all, just concerned about the good of someone else. It's interesting because this is Essentially, th this is probably the Greek word that we're all most familiar with, right? This is like if I were, if someone were to point at me, like I say, what's a Greek word? This is the one I would come up with most. Like I, I can't off the top of my head, I can only come up with one other, and that's only because we're about to go through that other word a little bit later. So this is pretty. Th this is the the word, especially the word for love that we're most mostly all familiar. There's there's even a New York State commercial about agape love that I haven't actually seen since Cuomo resigned, so I don't know if it's still playing or not, but there was a New York State commercial about agape love. <laughs> but the, um, anyways, so back in Paul's time, this is interesting because back in Paul's time, this was not a common word used for love. This was certainly not a common thing that was, was seen on display anywhere in, in anywhere in society. In fact, this is what, this was the main thing that set Christ's church apart from society. This is how they set themselves apart, by displaying this sort of agape love, where they weren't concerned about themselves, they were concerned about each other. 
And, and this was startling to see, right? It's, it's startling to see someone that's totally different than the rest of society. And people, people wanted to be a part of it. Some people didn't like it, obviously, but people wanted to be a part of it. John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one and another. That's another important thing. In this context, it's about loving each other. Obviously, we are to love God. That's how this whole chapter starts out. But what we're talking about here is how we're to love each other, specifically in the church. And there's many other verses that we can go to about love, right, throughout the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. Ephesians 4, 2, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. 1 First, first Peter for a above all keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins this this guys this really should be our highest priority other than loving god like jesus says here about it, when he's talking about the the greatest commandment uh in matthew chapter 22 verse 36 teacher which is the great commandment in the law and he said to him you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law of the prophets. It is crucial. And it's even described as being essential to being a follower of Christ. First John 3.14 says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Let me repeat that verse because that's important. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. It is one of the ways you know you are either converted or still lost. By contrast, if you don't love your brethren, you might want to take a good hard look at whether or not you are actually saved. Remember what we're talking about here. This isn't just the kind of love that is um, a feeling, right? This is a sacrificial love. This is the kind of love where we aren't concerned about ourselves at all. We're just concerned about the good of someone else. Many people have that shallow love, that feeling love. Everyone pretty much has it. Um, the something's in it for me love. We are, after all, a what's in it for me society. I'm even in, personally, I, what he didn't mention, but my, my full-time job is I'm essentially in sales. I'm a mortgage consultant. I'm in a what's in it for me business. My, I spend my day telling people why my mortgage services are what's in it for them. Like I, That's what I spend my day doing. I know the what's in it for me society, but you don't have to look hard. Just watch TV for two seconds, see any commercials. It's all about what's in it for us. Listen to any sort of radio talk show. It's all about what's in it for you. Um, everything. We are just inundated with what's in it for me. But that's not what we're here for. That's not what that Paul is talking about here. Um, people, people even choose their church from this perspective, a what's in it for me perspective. Instead of asking themselves, where does the Lord want me? They ask themselves or they ask each other, hey, where, ha where has the best coffee or the best praise band or the, I've had so many people say, uh, oh, I don't like that church. Their praise band's not that great. So they go to a church that is, is maybe doesn't have the most biblical preaching, but has a really great praise band. You know, I, I've seen, I've seen that so many times. Um, but the mark of a true believer in Jesus is this agape love it's a what can i do for them sort of love a self-sacrificial not what's in it for me years ago i had a, a youth group full of teenagers there's about 40 of them and they were all either not believers or they were super super new believers like they had just gotten to know jesus that year and um I geared my lessons very much towards them at the time. It was it was a very evangelical in nature. Um, hey, you know, the, every lesson was basically just evangelical, right? Well, I had this one kid who 
she was brought up in the church. She was very well versed in Bible. Honestly, she, at the time, she was probably more well versed than me. She was very well versed in the Bible. Very, um, very solid. Came from a very solid family. And I noticed all of a sudden, she stopped coming. And I was like, huh? You know, I was kind of bummed because the kids looked up to her and everything. So I uh, came up to her at church the next Sunday, and I was like, hey, where have you been? Um, I, I'd like you to be there. And she basically said to me. Uh, they're, they're so immature, talking about the other kids. They're so immature, and I don't really get anything out of the lessons. And me being the one who did all of those lessons, I was like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, that's my fault. I should have been gearing the lesson for all of them, including her. She was kind of the only one there out of 40, but I still should have been feeding her as well. And I wasn't, and I apologized to her. I said, I'm sorry, I, I will do better. I will... Um, I, I will gear my lessons so that you can get stuff out of them as well. And she, honestly, that made me a much better teacher because she said that she was honest with me, which was, which, which threw me back. I was like, oh, no one's ever kind of been that honest with me before. And uh, so I said, I will do that, but I want you to be there. And she goes, why? And I go, I don't want you to be there for you. I want you to come for them. I want you to come so that they can see your examples. When I ask a question, I want you to be the one raising your hand with the answer after the other kids strike out and, and try the typical answers of every time it's just, Jesus? Like, that's the typical answer you get whenever you ask a question. I, I want her to give the, the good answers at the end so that they can have something to aspire to, so they can, they can be more like her. And she started a co coming again, and it was great. Um, so now we come to our, our verse, uh, the, word, the word genuine. What does it mean to let love be genuine or without hypocrisy? It means it needs to be how you really are and how you really behave in real life. It can't just be a show, right? If it's just a show, it's not agape love because at that point you're doing it for something to, to gain for yourself. It's not sacrificial love of others. It's, it's, there's something in it for you. And that's what the world does. It's the what's in it for me attitude. But Paul is telling us to have a what's in it for them attitude. So we need to be honest with ourselves here. And this is really where, when I was doing all this research and everything for this, this is where I really felt like garbage. So this is where I want you to as well. Um, when, when you go out of your way to do something for someone else, when you go out of your way to help someone else, is it truly without hypocrisy is it truly without something to gain for you when you say that you will pray for someone for something is it are you being genuine will you really do it personally i always try to pray right then and there because otherwise i know i'm like a, a goldfish i will forget right so i try to pray right away otherwise i'll get distracted by something else and there's a shiny object over here and then i'm going that direction you know it's that easy for me so i have to pray right away when you do something nice for someone, is it truly out of agape love or is there something in it for you? This is something we all need to pray about and, and, and ask God to help us to remove any selfishness involved um, when it comes to loving others. It's, it's not easy. We need God's help. So now we very appropriately come to abhor what is evil. The next part of our verse is, and like anything else in the Bible, sorry, I feel like I'm looking straight down. Um, it, like anything else in the Bible, we have to look at the context. Remember, this is in the, it, it, the text as a whole is talking about how we should treat each other as members of the church. This is basically the other side of what we started out in. It's, it's abhor. Abhor means to hate. It's a rather intense word. So basically hate what will bring harm to other others. Utterly reject things that hurt others. So basically, whatever that may be, it could be false teaching. It could be sin in your own life that hurts others or sin in others that ultimately hurts themselves and others. Um, this is why we are to not be indifferent towards the sin in ourselves or in others. We can't be indifferent towards sin. A doctor who is a treating, treating a patient with, with cancer is not indifferent towards that cancer. They hate that cancer. They want to kill that cancer. 
This is one of the ways in which we are to show love for each other. There have been many times, many, many times, um, when I have witnessed other believers, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this as well, but I, I've witnessed it many times, where other believers are counseling other believers on something that is a direct result of that person's sin without confronting that sin at all. Because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to, to bring up someone's sin, just like it's uncomfortable to have your sin brought up. But, and the funny, the funny part is, they do it, we do it under the guise of trying to be loving. But you are not truly loving someone by ignoring their sin issue. The same way they are not truly loving you by ignoring your sin issue. The other side of this, the note um, is that this is essentially, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. I lost my spot. We need to love without hypocrisy. That includes abhorring what is evil. Another side note that, um, just to go off on a small little tangent, this is also essential when you're witnessing to someone, right? If you're trying to tell someone they need to believe in Jesus to, end, to spend eternity in heaven, they need to understand why they need Jesus. A person must first come to grips with the fact that they are a sinner that deserves hell before they can understand their need of salvation. They, if a person is to get saved, they need to uh, have some understanding of that they actually need to be saved from what, and what they need to be saved from, which is the wrath of God due to their sin. They need to know that their sin has made them guilty in sight of a holy God, a perfect and just holy God. Therefore, a price must be paid for their sin, which is why they must turn from their sin and trust in Jesus, who paid the price for their sins by dying on the cross, paying the price that they deserve to pay. It's not fun, though. It's not fun coming to grips with your sin. It's not fun, it's not fun to hear and to understand that we deserve to go to hell. We like to think that we are good. And telling someone they're a sinner is, is truly uncomfortable, but it is the loving thing to do because in order to love without hypocrisy, we must abhor what is evil. The other side of this verse is hold fast to what is good or cling to what is good. Another way to interpret the Greek word used here for hold fast or cling to is to be glued to what is good. If there is something good for others, holiness, godliness, then we should be affirming it. We should be promoting it. We should be clinging to it and encouraging it. It is how we support each other. We are to cling to what is good in our own lives and those around us. So this is essentially how we can truly love one another. We are to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Love cannot be genuine or without hypocrisy unless we abhor what is evil and, what, and cling to what is good. Love cannot be genuine unless we hate the sin in ourselves or, or, or in others that ultimately hurts each other and hurts others. And, and hate the sin. Enabling sin and tolerating sin in others is not true love. It is actually you not loving them enough to try and stop it. Uh, I'll just repeat that. Enabling sin and tolerating sin of others is not true love. It is actually you not loving them enough to try and stop it. If you see someone about to walk off a cliff, the loving thing to do is to stop them from walking off that cliff. Even if, it, even if stopping them might upset them at first. If you stop them, they're going to be pretty thankful once they realize they were about to go off a cliff. Except sin is a lot more dangerous than a cliff because sin is dangerous for eternity. So don't let the media or others fool you into thinking the loving thing to do is to tolerate sin in the name of tolerance and acceptance. The loving thing to do is to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Love the sinner, right? Because we all fall under that category. I don't know about you, but I certainly do. But hate the sin. So now we come to the beginning part of verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. 
or be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Again, the context in these verses in particular are talking about the context of the church. We with other believers, right? The, the type of Greek word he, used here is the other Greek word that we might know, uh, which is Philadelphia. And that's because we have a city named after, and the city is the city of brotherly love, which is what this Greek word means. We are to love each other like family. Now, this isn't always easy, as I'm sure many of you experienced at Thanksgiving this year. When you're with family who who know you know all their negative attributes and they certainly know yours because the longer you're around people the harder it is to hide your negative attributes right it's not always easy that is when love can be tough and this happens in a church as i'm sure many of you have experienced in fact we just had a, a church meeting uh last week and there were, there were some strife. Some people were upset with some decisions that were being made. And there was three or four people that were pretty upset, and they were vocalizing that upset. But you know what? At the end of the day, we're still a family. You know? We can, they, we can agree to disagree, and, and we can lovingly help try and bring each other over to, you know, understanding. But at the end of the day, we're family, and that is how we are to love each other. And not only that, but the next part of our verse is outdo one another in showing honor. I'm a super competitive person, right? So I play a lot of sports. Well, I used to before COVID. Now I don't play too many, but I'm very competitive. So when I'm in maybe a basketball tournament or something like that, I like to see how good my opponent is before I play them so I can outdo them. I can be better. Or if I'm playing or racing someone, I want to see how fast they are so I can beat their time or beat you know i want to i want to beat them i want to outdo them and that's what we're to do in terms of showing honor or respect it's not like it's a competition though right it's not like the classic when you're talking about humility and saying i'm way more humble than you you know sort of thing it's not like that we are but we are to elevate each other above ourselves that is how we are to outdo one another in showing honor we are to elevate each other above ourselves the opposite, the opposite of this, obviously, would be to gossip. We, in our very nature, want to bring each other, not bring each other, but bring others down to try and make ourselves look better in the eyes of whoever we're talking to or make, our, or make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Um, so that's why we gossip. When you gossip, you are bringing someone down in order to feel better about yourself. People do this in the workplace all the time. So before I was in the mortgage industry for the last year and a half or a year and whatever, um, before that I was a, an assistant director of operations for a fairly large um, uh, agency for people with intellectual disabilities. So I was basically in charge of a region. I was in charge of houses and day programs in a region. So I had about 60 or 70 staff underneath me reporting to me and they would constantly try to make each other look better. More often than not, it was trying to make whoever their manager was look bad in my eyes so that I would, in the, uh, this is what they were hoping for, that I would demote the manager and put them in charge as if that was ever going to work. And I, um, I would tell them all the time, and they would still try this. I would, I would tell them constantly, you will never look better in my eyes by making someone else look worse. The way to look better in my eyes was to make each other look better. And I would promote people that way and they would see that. Because the way I kind of thought about it was I could teach whatever job I'm promoting them to. I could teach them how to manage people, but I, I can't teach integrity. So that that's essentially I wanted people of good character to be promoted and the like even if they successfully made someone look bad and I had to maybe demote them because they brought something to light, I was never going to promote that person to the position. I was going to get someone else that was making each other, making them, each other look good, right? We as believers are called to take this idea of character and integrity to an even higher degree. We are to outdo one another in showing honor. Not outdo one another in looking better, Um, than each other but in showing honor we need to strive each and every day to lift each other up because we are a family to consider each other more important 
than ourselves. This agape love. In my ESV Bible, the title of this little section in Romans chapter 12 is The Marks of a True Christian. And this is, if you, if you do this, if you do these things and, and show true agape love, it is the marks of a true Christian. Christians and people will take notes. People will want to know why you guys love each other, why you are like a family, why you have this crazy agape love. And then you get to tell them that you get to tell them why you are different. Because while you were still lost in your sins, Jesus loved you so much that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again, bringing salvation to anyone who will repent and believe. You get to tell them that once you were truly saved, once you truly believe that you can never be the same again. You can never love the same again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we go out from here this morning, Lord, I just, I pray that each one of us will strive to have this agape love for each other, Lord, that we will lift each other up and, and outdo one another in showing honor and just be a true family, Lord. We, I thank you for each and every person here today, Lord, and please bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Oregon Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, if you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.